God bless you. We're we're getting we're going to get into the word. Let's go back. Uh, uh, we're going to go into the scripture. I want you to go uh, with me uh, in your Bibles. I want you to turn with me to uh, again uh, to the book of Second Corinthians, the tenth chapter. We're going to go there again, um, and we're going to look at we're going to we're going to start at the third verse, and uh, it says. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your disobedience, excuse me, when your obedience is fulfilled. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I want to again talk about the, the battle of the mind. I, the, the three battleground book is a tremendous book. Uh, but I think that that uh, one of the things that we need to emphasize is this. If you do not win the battle of the mind, you will not win the battleground on the battleground of the church or the battleground in heavenly places. You have to win the battle in the battleground of your mind. And if you do not, if, if the devil defeats you there, he has you. And you will never be effective in defeating him in spiritual warfare. So Paul says, Paul says that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God till the pulling down of strongholds. Please somebody, I, I hear your mic, if you could just, uh, mute your mic. He said, um, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. And then verse five says, casting hey, down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Last week, we talked about the stronghold of, in the mind. He said the pulling down of stronghold. And he talks about thoughts. He talks about uh, reasoning. He talks about knowledge. He talks about uh, theories, imaginations, thoughts, speculations, arguments, and reasoning. If you read it in the Amplified Translation, it deals with thoughts, speculations, imaginations, arguments, theories, and reasoning. And so the battleground in your mind is going to determine how much victory you're gonna have in your entire being, in your life. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so the battleground that we, the first battleground that we deal with Satan with is the battleground of the mind. Now the Bible says also in Ephesians six, it talks about that, um, uh, the shield of having the shield of faith that you might quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Let me say this is that the darts of Satan against us is the devil's missiles are thought missiles. He, he, he sends thoughts. He sends thoughts because what you think develops your conclusions and your conclusions develops what you believe. And therefore, you are the sum total of your thoughts. Uh, what I, what we, what many times is called your mindset. And some people are set in their minds, set in their ways. It is your mindset, and that is the fortress. That's the fortress that the enemy is 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 fighting you most in. Is that, and he it, and he locks you down in your thought life. He knows that he has you. So when those arrows come, they come and they are thoughts. And uh, uh, let, let's look at a, uh, a few scriptures. One of the things that we must understand is that when we are born again, come into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that our spirit is born again. We have a new spirit. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. We have a new spirit. But our souls has still has to be saved. James, in the book of James, it says that we are to receive the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. 
Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It deals with the, 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 the mind, the thoughts, the mind that dictates your, 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 uh, your will and dictates your emotions. And so we need to understand that when we get saved and born again, even though we are saved, even though we're born again, even though we have a new spirit, our soul has not been changed. That's why Paul says in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, is that I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, as they used to say with that commercial. Your mind is, 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 is the production house that produces all of the things, all that, that dictates all of your actions of your life. And so before you try to hit the devil in the, in, uh, in the heavenlies, let's deal with this devil that's de that's, that's, that you're dealing with in your mind. Now, turn to, with me to a script, to a, a, a familiar scripture. Turn with me to Romans, the eighth chapter. The book of Romans, the eighth chapter. And let's look at, uh, we're going to look at verses, um, uh, let's start at verse 5, Romans chapter 8, verse 5. And it says this, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Now, this is what I want, carnally minded. There is, a, uh, the, Paul in, in the book of Romans talks about the carnal mind, talks about the carnal or the fleshly mind. In other words, and he's talking to Christians about a carnal mind. The carnal mind is, 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 is a fleshly mind. It is an unrenewed mind. It is the mind of a believer that has come into the kingdom of God, been saved by the grace of God, but now, but they have never, their mindsets have never been changed. Their, their thinking, their paradigms uh, their, has never been changed. And so Paul is admonishing them uh, because he's in a, a chapter of Romans, he's dealing with, praise God, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So he is talking about a, a, a believer that is carnally minded, fleshly minded. Their mind has not been renewed. They still think in terms of, of, of fleshly things and, 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 and they live out of their fleshly nature. And he talks about that, uh, that uh, if you walk after your flesh, if you walk after the carnal self, the carnal mind and and not after the spirit that it is a death now he says that in verse six for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace let me say this is to live as a believer with a carnal mind dominance which your carnal mind dominates you is living a is a living death it's as if you're living and you're yet you're dead because everything is contradictory to the newborn spirit that God has placed on the inside of you. Everything is contradicting that. And so it is a, it's a living death. I, I've seen people live their lives, all their lives in their flesh, never renewing their mind, never submitting to the word of God completely, and they live a living death. Now, look what he said. He said, to be counted in mind is death. You're living, it's, it's, you know, they had a movie at one time called The Night of the Living Dead. It's like a living dead person. You're, 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 you're saved, 
you're born again. The spirit of God's on the inside of your spirit, but but it has never affected your, your mind, your will, your emotion, your flesh. And so you're a living death. But then he says this, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I don't know about you, but but I want life and I want peace. You will never have peace as a believer. I know sometimes people say, well, you know, before I got there, I didn't have no problem doing it. Now that, that I got saved and I'm doing these things and my 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 my, my spirit is, is bothering me, my conscience is bothering me and so on and so forth and I have no peace. It's because until you submit your flesh to that which you have been received in your spirit, you never you in, align them together. You are in constant conflict. That's why Paul says that in seventh verse, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Uh, in other words, he's saying uh, in, in the, in the, um, uh, the, the uh, NIV translation of that, he says, um, in chapter, uh, excuse me, I just lost my place. Just give me a second here. Um, Romans, Romans 8, okay. And, and in the NIV uh, of verse number six, he says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Listen to verse seven. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. You, it, it will never, it will never submit to God. It will never uh, surrender to God. It is in direct conflict, hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It will not. You have got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to cast down imaginations. You have to win this battle in your mind. If you don't win it in your mind, you will not win it in, in any other realm. And so there's no use in going on to talking about battlegrounds of the church and battlegrounds in heavenly places and, and fighting demons and, and so on and spiritual. You are no match because your mind, the, the mind, your mind has imprisoned you and allowed Satan to hide in certain areas of your mind. I, I, I'm going to read some, uh, uh, out of, out of uh, the, um, the three battleground book that I, uh, some significant things that I just pulled out. And uh, uh, the, um, I want to read on, uh, on page number 30. Uh, well, let me let me start it on page number 29 of the book. And at the bottom, it says, taking every thought captive to Christ. While we may find comfort in being Christians, being a Christian has not made us perfect. There are still many strongholds within us. Therefore, let us identify some of these spiritual fortresses. The spiritual fortresses, excuse me. Rare is a Christian who is not limited by at least one of the following strongholds. One of the first strongholds is the stronghold of unbelief. Second is, is the stronghold of cold love. Our love is cold. Another stronghold is fear. Another stronghold is pride. Another stronghold is unforgiveness. Another stronghold is lust. Another stronghold is greed. And, and, and any of these, these, these are strongholds that have been set up by the enemy. And, and I like, I'm reading the last uh, paragraph on page 29 of, of the book. Because we excuse ourselves so readily, it's difficult to discern the areas of oppression in our lives. After all, these are our thoughts, our attitudes, our perception. We justify and defend our thoughts with the same degree of intensity with which we justify and defend ourselves. As it is written, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, Proverbs 23 and seven. In other words, the essence of who we are is our thought life. Hmm. In other words, it's the way you think. 
One thing I have learned in life is perception is stronger than fact. Perception is stronger than fact. What do you mean perception? In other words, what people perceive to be a fact or perceive to be true, they claim it as their truth. And so uh, we need to understand that, as I said, Satan attacks you in your mind with thoughts. Those are the arrows that he sends. Now, every thought is, does not come from Satan. So don't get that in your mind. But thoughts are the arrows, are the, are the darts, are the missiles of Satan that comes into your life. And if you're not willing to examine the thoughts that you think according to the word of God, according to the truth of God, you will never see change. You will always hit the same things because let me say this, is that these thoughts that you have in, that, that come to you, there can be thoughts that come from, from the, the spirit of God can give you thoughts. Satan can send thoughts your way. And then our fortresses of thoughts have come from our experiences, the things that we have been through, the way we, we were reared, the way we were taught. And, and, and I like in, in, um, in this book, again, I'll say this, The Three Battlegrounds by Francis Frangipan. And uh, in the, in the, on the page 30, the last portion of the first uh, paragraph says, the first stronghold that God must remove in your thinking is pride. For until one is willing to admit that he needs deliverance, he will never be free from strongholds. Pride. Now, now let me let me give you the 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 uh, the things that Satan uses to to defeat us. Um. Look at look at let's look at another scripture. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to. Go to um, 1 John, the second chapter. In the word of God, saints. This is Bible study. So we're going in the word. You should have your Bible out and you should be going to every scripture that I'm going to be like the Bereans and see if what I'm saying is true. Look at, at uh, 1 John and, and look at the, the second chapter of 1 John and look at verse number 15 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the verse 17 says, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, this is what I want you to see, is that the challenges, with, uh, the challenges that we face is many times, it is, it is not just the devil. It's the, it's the world, it's the flesh and the devil. And, and, and the devil is the one that shapes the, uh, the values of the world. And he, and, and he wants to dominate your flesh. Now, let me say this is that you, you need to understand that, that, uh, that, that the nature of, of God is love. The nature of God is love because the Bible says God is love. So the nature of God is love. The nature of Satan is lust. The nature of Satan is lust. Lust is an unquenchable desire for things, for, uh, 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 for, 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 for things other than the things of God. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, in other words, lust can never be fulfilled. It can never be filled up. It can never be satisfied. 
That's why some folks ain't satisfied with, I ain't satisfied with this. I ain't satisfied with that. I ain't satisfied with the church. I ain't satisfied with my husband. I ain't satisfied with my wife. I ain't satisfied with the praise. I ain't satisfied. You ain't satisfied with nothing because lust can never be satisfied. Lust will always drive you. It is the nature of Satan. In the eighth chapter of, of, the, of, the, of the book of, um, I believe it's, um, I believe it's the book of, of, of Matthew, but I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure. But it actually talks about that Jesus said that to the Pharisees, he said, you're of your father, the devil. His lust, lust, and it's a, with L-U-S-T-S, -S, is lust you will do. In other words, the nature of Satan is lust. The nature of, 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 of God is love. Love is, is kind. Love is patient. Love wanted it not itself. Lust, it wants everything. It wants it now. It wants it my way. It wants, it wants to satisfy my flesh. It wants to satisfy my desire. James said it like this. James said that, that why is it in the fourth chapter of the book of James, in the first verse, he said, why is it so much quarreling? and wars among you. He said, is it not because of the lust that is in your flesh? You have not, you want, you, you desire, you don't have it, you want it, you want it, you want more, you get more, and you want more. This is not God. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. It, can you ever get to the point where you're satisfied with God, satisfied with, with, with what God has, has promised us? He promised us that he's given us all things to enjoy. But he also is telling us that we need to be able to be content. We need to be able to live content, peaceful lives. Life and peace is in, is in God by the spirit. And the spirit is a spirit is, is love. His spirit is a, is a spirit of love. So we need to understand that the reason there's quarreling and there's fighting, it says because you see somebody else with something and you want it, uh, uh, you know, and, and you go after it, it's a lust. You can have a lust for ministry. You can have a lust for ministry. And people don't realize lust, the devil, if he can't get you to stop doing something, you know what he'll do? He'll make you go overboard. He'll make you go overboard. I have known preachers that have left their wives, left their families, and talking about because they feel like that uh, the ministry is so important until it supersedes anything as far as their family and so on. There's no balance in their lives. I remember hearing in, in, uh, uh, Benny Hinn say that uh, one of the things with him and his wife when they got their divorce, his thing was the ministry was, was above everything and so on and so forth. And they ended up getting a divorce. Now they're back together. Now, thank God, God brought them back together and gave some balance in his life. It ain't, look, it's more than ministry. It's your family. It's, 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 your, it's your responsibility to your, to your employers. You cannot get in this thing where you're lusting for stuff and calling it God. It ain't God, it's lust. Because, it, because God doesn't push you to do anything. God will lead you and draw you, but he will not push you. The devil pushes you into doing stuff. When the devil can't get you to, 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 to stop, he'll get you to, to go overboard. And so the devil don't have any problem because that's his nature is lust. He was the director, Lucifer, of the worship. My God, you are the leader of the worship of God. And here it is. But now you want what God has. You're lusting for what God is, what God has. And therefore, that lust could not be fulfilled. God found pride in him. Pride and lust go together. Let's go together. Let, let, me, let me read that again. It says that all that is in the world, verse 16, 1 John, the second chapter, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, see lust, and the pride of life. Pride is one of the first things you must deal with, is your pride. Because pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If, if Satan can get you to operate in pride, you have violated God's, God's principle of he gives grace to the humble, he resists the proud. 
And God will resist you. God will resist you because of your pride. Because he'll see what you do as pride. You, you don't do it and, 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 and it will, it will virtual, it will uh, cause you to begin to, to walk in, in this insatiable, unsatisfiable desire of lust. Never satisfied, never happy, never content, you know? And, and some people are talking about, it's my drive. You know what? You need to check out and be honest and, 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 and bring that before God and see if it's if it's really pride, if it's really lust, or is it really God? Now, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. So the first thing that he talks about in here, now, uh, let me move on, is that you're going to have to deal with the stronghold of pride. That 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 means that in order to recognize what is wrong in us, this is the next uh, paragraph on on uh, page thirty. We must perceive God's standard of right. David in the height of ecstasy and Job in the pit of misery, as well as all of us in between. We ask, we, uh, we ask the same age old question, what is man? The writer of Hebrews asked the same question, but then answered it in under the inspiration of the spirit. We do see him, namely Jesus. Jesus is the model of what God considers typical for a new creation man. He is not just our savior. He is the indwelling one who conforms us to his image, the firstborn of a family of glorious sons. The, the greatest call in your life is not a preacher. My greatest call is not as an apostle or as a pastor. My greatest call is to be conformed to the image of Christ. How much am I walking and, 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 uh, and mimicking Christ and, and showing forth who Christ is through my life, through, through my relationships, uh, through, through, uh, 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 my, uh, through my, my lifestyle. So we need to understand that the greatest thing is to, be, is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And pride has no place ever. And all of us deal with it. All of us deal with it. I'm going to talk about how to control your thoughts a little bit later. I got a few more minutes, so let me, but I, I want to read over also on verse 13, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> chapter 31, uh, I mean, page 31 of, of, of uh, in the, the book. Um, I want to, I want to read um, in the first, second paragraph, it says, consequently, when we seek to identify and destroy demonic strongholds, the second fortress that we must annihilate is the stronghold of unbelief. It is this scheme of thinking that tells us Christ-likeness is impossible. Hmm. See, the thought is, you can't be like Christ. You know, in the world, you can be Christ-like. And that thought will keep you from going from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from level to level. It says that it's impossible. Christ-likeness is impossible, which holds us further, holds us further spiritual growth hostage. This lie and the chain it places upon our hearts must be stripped from our lives. Accordingly, take this moment to begin to pray in your spirit. Let the Holy Spirit rise and flood your heart. If you suffer from a stronghold which says you will never be like Christ, the stronghold can, can begin to come down right now. And he, of course he gives a prayer. We're not gonna get into that right now, but this thing of that you cannot live a holy life or you can't live a life that, that is Christ-like is, is not true. The Bible says in Jude that, that the grace of God had appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Look, we can. We can be like Christ or God would have never have told us to be holy or told us uh, to uh, live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. So we need to understand, we're gonna have to deal with our flesh, lust of the flesh, the desires of our flesh, lust of the eye, that our eye gate, our flesh is our gate of feelings. 
and the pride of life. We're going to have to deal with pride and lust. And we have to deal with it. And if we do not deal with it, we'll be defeated in our mind, defeated in our faith, defeated in our walk with God. We'll live, uh, we'll live a life as if we're in a prison of death because we're never able. That's why Paul said in, in, in the eighth chapter of Romans, when he, remember, remember when he, in seventh chapter, he talked about when I would to do good, evil is present with me. He's telling you the struggle that many of us have to go through. But when he gets to Romans eight, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, that walk not after the flesh, not just in Christ Jesus, but walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The spirit of God, the spirit of God. When we receive that in, in, the, in the born again experience, then of course we can be baptized with the Holy Ghost and the spirit of God. The spirit of God is called the spirit of truth. If you walk after the spirit of truth, everything that the Holy Spirit tells you, teaches you, guides you, leads you in is true. It is no lie in him. The Bible says that, that the devil is a liar. In that same scripture that talks about doing the lust of the devil, if, in that same scripture, it talks about that the devil is a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning. He's lying to you in your mind. He's lying to you. And if you receive that thought as true, that's why you need the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And every thought, everything, every thought that comes to you, that comes at you, you have to censor that. You have to edit that, censor that through the word of God, through the spirit of God. You cannot walk after your flesh. You have to walk after the spirit. And you're going to have to get acquainted with the Holy Spirit in your life and allow the spirit to guide you, to lead you, to deal with you in every area of your life. Be carnally minded, the Bible says, is death. A carnal mind is one that's born again, but lives out of their flesh, fleshly nature or lives out of their lust. But, but Galatians 5 and 16 says, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's why the spirit of God is so very, very important. Now, let me deal with this. Controlling, controlling your thoughts. Controlling your thoughts. I learned this years ago, and, it, and it, it's been something that, I, that I've done down through the years, and it's helped me in my spiritual growth. Hope it'll help you. And let's look at, let's turn over to a scripture. The scripture is James, the first chapter. James, the first chapter. Look at James. Chapter one. And let's go down to the 14th verse. I'm going to read it in the King James. I'm reading in the Amplified Translation. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In the Amplified Translation, it reads like this. It says, but every man is, every person is tempted when he is drawn away, enticed and baited by his own evil desires, lust, and passions. Then the evil desire, when it is con has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully matured, brings forth death. Saints, if the evil desire is not conceived, it cannot bring forth. In other words, evil desires or evil thoughts, let me, let me, let me look at it in, in another translation also, in the NIV translation. Uh, verse 15 says, then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. In other words, the, the thoughts, thoughts that come to your mind, thoughts that come to you, um, one of the first things that you must learn is how to immediately dispel, disregard thoughts that are contrary to the word of God 
and not let them linger. Because if thoughts linger, they become meditations. They become meditations. They, they begin to, to, you begin to think about them over and over and over again. If you dispel these doubts before they are conceived, they, the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, what Satan has, has tried to do against you will, will be aborted out of your life. Lack of a better word. It's just like a woman. If, if there is no, if there is no con conception, there can be no birth. If, if, and so there is, it's important that the seeds, these thought seeds that come your way, that you dispel them immediately. Now, I, I've said this in times past, but I'll say it again. In, in, my, in, my, in my early walk with God, I, you know, I didn't know the word. Uh, I mean, you know, I've heard, I had heard a lot of sermons, but I didn't know the word. But one thing that I, that I, that I knew is the way that I got saved was through um, uh, crying out to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And, and I found out that I could, I could literally call on the name of the Lord and I could dispel thoughts. If I had a thought that came to my mind that I knew was an evil thought or a sinful thought or a lustful thought, I would begin to praise. I begin to thank the Lord. I bind this, and then I begin to thank God. And I would I would deal with that immediately. Sometimes, and 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 uh, you know, when you're doing that, you do it. You sometimes you do it unconsciously, and people it, it, when you do it, people would like people would like look at me. What, what's wrong with you? You know, I'd be working. Thank you, you know, because hey. You know something that I didn't see something that I don't need to be seeing, and uh, and I'm and it's and it's bringing thoughts to my mind, and I would literally deal with thoughts. Don't allow these arrows, these thoughts, to be conceived. And one of the ways you can do that is by praise, and of course, using the shield of faith. You have got to believe that God's truth is real, God's word is real, and that these thoughts that come that you will deal with them immediately. Number one, challenge every thought. You notice that he said, he said, bringing every thought unto the obedience of Christ. Challenge thoughts. Don't just think, oh, I just thought that. No, you didn't just think that. That thought came from somewhere. It could have come from the Holy Spirit, but it also could have come from an arrow, a dart that was sent from the enemy. And you have to challenge thoughts. You got to know how to challenge thoughts. That's your battle. Challenge the thoughts. In other words, you're not coming in here. I am not going to think that. I'm not going to think. The Bible talks about thinking the best. Love thinks the best of everyone. How many times have, have something happened with you and an individual or some, and automatically a thought came to your mind? I remember, I remember years ago, uh, 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 one of our members saying to me, uh, coming to me and saying, you know, you, you know, I found out, you know, because after we had a few fellowships, and I, oh, you, you're not like I thought you were. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you, you know? He said, you know, you would come down the aisle after you minister or whatever, and he said, and and, uh, and, and, and and you walk right by me and so on. So when you walk by me, the what the thought came in my mind, you know, he's what's you know, he's he's arrogant. Uh, or what? See, those thoughts come immediately. Bam, bam. They, he's shooting at you. And if you don't challenge those thoughts, if you don't say, no, nah, no, nah, he could have just, if you don't give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe he probably didn't even see me. And I, and I remember telling the person, I didn't even see you. I didn't even see you. I was not avoiding you. I didn't even see you. You know, but thoughts can, can literally imprison us. And so you must, number one, if you're going to control your mind, you must challenge thoughts, challenge thoughts that come to your mind. Secondly, if you're going to control your mind, subject every thought, subject every thought to the truth of Christ. Subject every thought to the truth of Christ. The Bible says, let every man, let God be true and every man a liar. I don't care if that thought, if it's against God, it's a lie. It is a lie. 
is because God is true. Let God be true and every man alive. So you must deal with your thoughts. Challenge every thought, number one. Secondly, subject every thought to the truth of Christ. And you have to do this because, and you, you're going to have to do it mechanically until eventually it becomes something that you, that, that you do. And, and, and sometimes after that, you're going to have to do it mechanically. Because because some of your the, the thoughts is your thoughts is what's got you all messed up is what you think. And you're thinking the wrong thing. And when you think the wrong thing, your perceptions are wrong and your perceptions becomes your fact. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, that's my truth? Well, it, yeah, that means that's your perception. That's your mindset. That's the way you think. But that's but if it ain't according to God's word, if it ain't true according to God's word, it's a lie. And and Satan is the father of lies. And now Satan has a place that he can he can dwell in your mind. And many times the fortress that the enemy has set up, that, that the enemy has in your, uh, that you have set up through these thoughts, have made a hiding place for Satan to get and to take control in that area. And so you need to understand that you must subject every thought to the truth of Christ. And, and uh, another thing too, protect your mind by not exposing it unnecessarily to certain information. Control your mind, protect your mind, by not subjecting it to certain information. I know this is old fashioned. I do not spend all of my time viewing stuff that is contrary to what I believe. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you you can't watch television that you know that you know that was that was way back in the day when when the when the when the old holiness people they you know I remember we had a a, a lady that that was at my father's church that babysitted for us a while and one of the things she talked about was that when she got saved you know they told her that, that you know tv so she actually took her tv and stuck it out in the, in the back now i'm not telling you take your tv and put it in the alley if i told some of you to do that y'all drop y'all y'all fall out <laughs> i'd have to have a deliverance service and a resurrection service right away but what i am saying is is that there are certain things you cannot expose yourself to because and 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 some people say, well, you know, I want to, I want the information. You know, I want to know about this. Some things I just don't need to know. I've, 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 you know, since I found the light, and I'm in the light. What am I looking for? Dark. What am I looking in the darkness for? What am I searching in the darkness for? I, I found him. I found the truth. So you, so you don't expose yourself. Don't expose your mind to a whole lot of reading. You know. Uh, reading mystical stuff and all kinds of stuff. You know, I had I had a a prophet say to me, nobody in our church, nobody, nobody, nobody y'all don't know it, so don't be trying to think of who this is. But was telling me about um, have I ever read the lost books of the Bible? You know, the books. You know, some of the books that that were not put in, that were not canonized. And you read those books, you know, they, this is a prophet, you know, it's supposed to be so deep. You know, if you read these books and he was telling me some of the things that were in the books. And, and there's reasons that when they were canonizing the book, the, the, the measuring what script should be in scripture and what shouldn't be in scripture, there were certain uh, uh, criteria it had to meet. And if it didn't meet that criteria, they didn't put it, they didn't include it in the canon. Now the Catholic church concludes some of those books but they were not included in the canon of scripture. And, uh, and so I have a book on the canonization of scripture. And, uh, but you know, you can read about how they canonized the scripture and, and they came up with, but the thing about it is, is that I have no time to be reading the book of demons. I don't need to read the book of demons. I don't need to read that. Why would I expose myself to that? Why would I expose myself to stuff that would that would come against the knowledge of Christ that would hinder my faith, hinder me from believing, hinder me from walking in miracles and signs and wonders, hinder me from getting answers to prayer? Uh, why would I why would I spend my time doing that? What are you searching for? And I thought to myself when the person was telling me this, 
was thinking to myself, you know, the Bible talks about that, that there'll come a time when people will have what the Bible calls itching ears, that their ears are itching. They're, they, they, will, they will be looking for some new thing. They want to be deeper than anybody else. They want to have greater insight than anybody else. And so on and so forth. And they begin to get into all these other things. And I, I said, no, I haven't read it. Oh, you should read it. I said, mm, okay. I'm thinking to myself, I am not spending my time. Now, now that's one thing, because that can produce, along with other stuff, false doctrines. And so you need, and you don't need to be looking at stuff that is, that is lustful, that, that genders lust, you know, and, you know, pornography and all that. That is not God. And that just breeds and that deal and, and will, will cause the lust of the flesh to be uh, uh, personified, for lack of a better word. It is not, you cannot expose. So protect your thoughts. Because surely if you look at something and read something, you're going to think about it. And now it's invading your thoughts. And, and so Paul says that they were to bring every casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God or the truth of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So number three, protect your thoughts by not exposing it uh, to information that, 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 is, that is not productive and that does not bring fruit. Now, I'm not telling you you can't, you know, you can't, um, you know, read maybe certain literature or whatever. I'm not saying it or history. I love history. I love history, you know, and, and uh, but I'm, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to expose myself to this stuff because it ain't, it ain't on the same level as the truth of God's word. Take control of your thoughts. Take control of your thoughts. Do not allow the enemy, the, the, they used to say, the old saints used, so used to say, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. Now, what they were saying basically was, is that if, if our mind is not focused, the Bible says he will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. There is, it's impossible with us going to work, with us, with us, with us having to deal with the, the, the basic things of life and in interaction with people, business and so on that we're not going to be we can't always be have Jesus on the front of our mind but what we can do is we can we can filter what we think our thoughts through the truth of Christ and when we do when we do I've learned this over the years and I hope that it's imparted to you is that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth if you walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is in allowing the spirit of truth to dominate and to dominate your, your, your thoughts. You can live in, your, in, in the spirit, in your spirit, man. You can live by the spirit and, and not allow yourself to be bound by the flesh. The Bible says that lest Satan get an advantage of you, for we're not ignorant of his devices. And the devices of Satan, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, uh, he can, controlling thoughts and paradigms. I, I like something that, they, that is said in the book, and I'm going to close. It's almost 8 o'clock. We'll try to go an hour. Is, is, um, talks about some of the strongholds in this book. And, um, and uh, I was trying to find and see. Okay. Um, I thought I'd highlighted it. Let me see. In fact, I, what I'll do, and what I'm going to do then, is I see these, I'm going to talk about these other three strongholds. Uh, later, but let me let me just conclude. Let me conclude by this.
thoughts are powerful. Your thinking, your mind is powerful. The mind is the is 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 the is the um, is the ground for the seeds of revelation, the seeds of knowledge, the seed of wisdom. If you control your thoughts, you can control your life. If you can control your thoughts, you can control your life. And Satan knows that if he can in, if he can fill your mind with the wrong thoughts. He keeps you bound. So the first battleground, first battleground, and, and the reason I'm spending time on it is because it is the most important. How do you think? Because how do you think it's gonna be determining what you get, what you receive? When your thinking is wrong, your living is wrong. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Let's, let's believe God that every thought, and, 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 and Paul said, bring every thought, bring it subject, subject it. Control what you think. Analyze what you think. Truthfully, by the word of God. If you do that, what will happen is, is that the, the, when, you, when you filter it with the word of God, First of all, the word of God is going to divide what is truth and what is a lie. You're going to be able to dis, to to remove that which is which is false for that which is real. You you you're now replacing mindsets and paradigms with scriptural, biblical, truth, thoughts, paradigms and ideas. And as a result of that, your mind becomes begins to be renewed. You begin to think you begin to develop what is called in the scripture, the mind of Christ. You literally begin to have the mind of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was equal with God, thought it, uh, though, though he was God, he thought it not equal, it was not a thing to be held upon. He took on himself the, the form of, of flesh, and he condemned sin in the flesh. Let this mind be in you that also in Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he did not, he made himself of no reputation. He took on himself the form of a servant. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. If we follow Christ in our humility to, to God, in our submission to God, in our uh, giving up of our pride, one more thing I wanna, wanna share with you that the Lord gave me and I, and I wanna share with you, and he gave me this, is because if you wanna control your thoughts and your mind, one of the things is you're gonna to have to deal with your pride. One of the things the Lord gave me, and I've, and I've said this before, in the word sin, S-I-N, if you take the, the I out of the middle of that, it spells nothing. Pride, I, my ministry, my this, my that, my education, my is all about us. And that's pride. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. And we praise you, Lord God, because Lord, you, you said that we have the mind of Christ. Father, let our minds be renewed by the word. Let us challenge every thought. Let us subject every thought to the truth of Jesus Christ. Let us protect our mind by not exposing our mind, our eyes, our flesh to things that will cause us that are contrary to Christ. Let us control our thoughts. You said when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Let these thoughts not be conceived in our minds any longer. Let us stop the conception of thoughts and let us challenge the thoughts that we have already and cause them to be subject to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen, praise God, hallelujah. I hope you received something tonight. It's even blessed me tonight because it's, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, if you get, if your mind is set, boy, I'm telling you, you know, my mother used to say, 
and I set my mind to do something. You know, some people, you know, when they set their mind to do it, you can do it. It's something about when you just set your mind. And, 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 and we're going to have to deal with anything that's contrary to Christ. And then we're going to have to set our mind on Christ. Let this mind be in you. God bless you. Um, hope you receive something. Have a great night. Look forward to, to, uh, to seeing you on Sunday, ministry on Sunday. You be blessed in Jesus' name. We love you guys. God bless you. Good night.